Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, The Foremost Common Problems in Multiplex Panel Design. My name is Ted Dacko, and I'm going to serve as your host today. The webinar will be presented by John Santa Lucia. Hi, everyone. So here is our agenda. I'd like to introduce the speaker in just a second. Then we'd like to tell you a little bit about our sponsor today, DNA Software. And we will cover the four problems of multiplex. We'll provide a solution for the four problems of multiplex and actually provide you with a demonstration of what a solution might look like. And we'll talk about the benefits. Then we'll do a quick summary for you, and then we will answer your questions, and we'll talk about next steps. So I'd like to introduce our speaker, John Santa Lucia. John has been a professor at Wayne State University for over 23 years. He is a world-renowned biophysical chemist with over 50 papers and one book. He's served on numerous, numerous government panels, and he's been a consultant to new, uh, numerous companies as well, many of which are on the phone today, and I do need to, to point out that we have well over 100 people registered for this webinar, so this is a very interesting topic. Major DNA Nearest Neighbor Thermodynamic Parameters, and he is the co-inventor of qPCR copy count. He founded DNA Software in 2000. As the first 10 years, he was the chief science officer, and for the past seven years, he has been the president and CEO. John, welcome. Thank you, Ted. So, John, my first question to you is, can you tell the audience a little bit about DNA software and why you founded the company? Sure, Ted. Back when I was a professor, we were studying the fundamental aspects of DNA folding and DNA hybridization and mismatch thermodynamics. And we started getting a lot of phone calls from uh, different companies and academic labs asking us, asking if I could consult with them to help solve their problems. And it became very obvious to me early on that um, there was a need, there was a commercial need uh, for, uh, to solve the problems that people had and that I couldn't do it in my academic lab. So we started DNA Software to try to meet those needs. That's, that's all I wanted to say about DNA Software for now. We'll get to share more as we go throughout the seminar. So can you tell us what these four problems of multiplex PCR are? Sure. So here's a sort of, um, first of all, the applications of multiplex PCR, and then I'll share with you how that dovetails into the problems. So the first application of multiplex PCR is for detection of infectious disease. So a lot of folks want to design panels of tests that will detect more than one pathogen at a time, uh, such as, for example, upper respiratory pathogens or a group of messenger RNAs found in human blood, et cetera. So the key there is to be able to account for target variation, and that's called consensus design. And there you want to be able to distinguish the target of interest from near neighbors and background sequences. Another application of multiplex PCR is for target enrichment. Here you might have something like 100 genes that are cancer-causing genes or involved in pathways involving cancer. And you want to enrich those targets for next generation sequencing. And that type of application involves very high levels of multiplexing, often from 100 plex to higher uh, levels of amplification needed. And there the trick is to get even amplification of all of the targets. And lastly, there is the need to do strain genotyping, particularly for SNPs, or uh, determining the strain of viruses and bacteria, for example. And there, there's a need to not only detect uh, genomes of different viruses and bacteria, but also to distinguish them. So I want to just summarize this. I think we'll be convincing you of this today. I don't think I need to make a hard sell on this. Designing multiplex PCR is hard, and we want to show you that we appreciate the nuances of that field. So here are the four most common problems to answer your question, Ted. The first is the problem of false negatives. That is um, a test where uh, a person has a particular disease, for example, and the test is negative, despite the fact that they have the disease. And those are caused by a variety of things that we'll be going over. What causes false negatives? False positives occur when a uh, person does not have a disease or the sample is not present in the test tube, but the test says that it is. It's a false positive. And we'll be showing uh, why that arises and what the solutions are to that problem. The third problem is the problem of coverage. This has to do with if you have a lot of different variants of a target of interest or if you have many different targets that you're trying to multiplex. 
how do you know that you can detect all of those different targets at the same time? So the first three topics really are technical in nature. The last topic about com company resource constraints is more physical. It has to do with, uh, well, we'll cover that when we get to it. Which of these four in your mind is the, is the uh, biggest challenge for, for organizations? Well, actually, the last one, the company resource constraints, is the largest problem because oftentimes people don't realize what's possible and don't realize that they have a need that they need to, to, to fill. Okay, well, let's get into it. Okay, so the first topic is about false negatives, and that has to do with sensitivity of assays. So what are the major causes of false negatives? So it's widely known, this first cause, A, is that target secondary structure can inhibit primer binding, and that's particularly true for RNA targets, but often true as well for DNA targets. So we'll cover that uh, topic in detail. But in addition to that, there is a number of other causes of false negatives. So those can be everything from false amplification due to primer dimers, false amplicons, primer amplicon interactions, unimolecular extension. All three of these last causes, B, C, and D, are due to polymerase extension and the depletion of primers and NTPs. So there's one other uh, cause of false negatives as well, and that's sequence variation. And we'll cover that topic in step three when we talk about coverage. So let's first talk about target secondary structure. Most users, uh, when they are considering um, primer hybridization, they use a two-state model. And they may even use some of the work that we published many years ago now, uh, like the nearest neighbor model, to predict the difference in energy between the random coil state and the duplex state. Now, it turns out that that model just is not sufficient in order to uh, really predict what's going on. And the reason for that is real DNA is not straight like this when it's in the random coil. In fact, real DNA molecules are folded. So shown on the right-hand side here is a more sophisticated model, an n-state model. Many states are, are included here. So now what we see is not only do you have, here's a hybridization region in green, and a two-state model would say, well, here's a hybridization region, and here's a primer, and they want to hybridize as shown on the right hand. Inside here. In fact, there's competing equilibria. The target itself can be folded, and in fact, that region to which you want to direct your primer can be uh, folded, and that folding inhibits the hybridization. You need to pay the energy to break that folding before a primer can bind. Also, the primer itself can bind, uh, can form a hairpin interactions, for example. And such hairpin interactions can, can sometimes be innocuous, and other times that hairpin interaction can cause other problems if that hairpin can serve as a template for a polymerase. So, so as I mentioned here, the problem with this approach, uh, the two-state approach, is that there's an energetic cost to break secondary structure. And that folding is one of the major causes of low sensitivity in single-plex PCR and definitely in multiplex PCR, where it's much more complex. And in particular with multiplex PCR, such folding of DNA can cause the amplification to be uneven. That is, one amplicon amplifies faster than other amplicons. Well, one of the major causes of that is that uh, some of the targets are more folded than others. And if you haven't folded your target DNA, there'd be no way for you to know that. The solution to this problem is to solve for the amount bound, to solve the coupled equilibria. All We have ways that DNA software to predict all of these equilibria and solve for the amount that is in the duplex state. And that amount is what is ultimately uh, related to your assay sensitivity. Now I'll cover a little bit about the other causes of uh, false negatives. So one of them I mentioned is the idea of formation of primer dimers. So just by accident, it can happen that two primers have pairing at their three prime end, and a polymerase would extend those. And that is problematic for PCR and multiplex in particular because it depletes the PCR primers. They get chemically used up and the NTPs get depleted as well. And that can ultimately cause the multiplex reaction to, to fail. Another type of interaction, which is particularly important in multiplexing, is primer amplicon interaction. So shown here in this picture uh, on the upper uh, right side is a target from the Zika virus, but there's a primer binding site for one of the other targets that's in your multiplex. Let's say it was a influenza A was also trying to be detected. So 
you have this influenza A primer binding to that Zika target, that cross hybridization reaction uh, can completely ruin that amplicon by making it shorter and making it so that the probe doesn't bind and therefore you get a false negative. So, so those are two uh, really important things to account for. And I think the first one, most primer design software accounts for. The second one is more subtle and harder to, to do. Uh, this last one is unimolecular extension. And, and I have a sort of question for you to think about. I've shown here five different primers. The sequences are similar to each other, but they're all a little bit different. And I have this question, which of these structures do you think is extensible? Now, you know, it's not obvious at first blush. And the, and the truth is, it depends. In fact, all of them are extensible in one way or another. And I'll show you what I mean by that. All right, so here are some considerations. First of all, some of the primers end with a mismatch at the end. And some mismatches are extensible and others are not. So for example, in this first case on the left-hand side, there's an AA mismatch. AA mismatches are generally not very extensible. So even though this is a thermodynamically stable hairpin, this particular hairpin is unlikely to be problematic for PCR. On the other hand, this primer over here in the middle that is, differs by one nucleus, that is changed the C at the end. Now it's an AC mismatch. Well, an AC mismatch actually is many polymerases find that to be tolerant and they will extend that. And once they extend that primer to the end, that primer has now changed its chemical composition and will no longer be viable in the PCR reaction. Now, I said that almost all of these could, in fact, be um, substrates for uh, polymerase extension. So that would happen if you happen to choose a polymerase that had three prime exonuclease activity. If your enzyme has exonuclease activity, it will actually chew back and remove some of these dangling end nucleotides until it creates a species that is, in fact, extensible. So that's something to think about, and that, that becomes very problematic, uh, and we generally don't recommend enzymes that have three prime exonuclease. And lastly, um, perhaps the most surprising of all is this structure that's on the uh, right-hand side. The rightmost structure has its five prime end base pair, and we wouldn't normally think that such a structure would be extensible by a polymerase. But think about what happens during a PCR reaction. During PCR, the complement of that sequence would be made. And once that complement was made, the complement would be highly likely to fold back on itself and form such a structure. And such structures at the three prime end of the antisense strand, such structures would be uh, a cause for forming uh, amplicon dimers or higher order concatenomers, which also are very problematic. They will shut down the PCR completely. So this brings us now to the second type of problem in PCR that we face, and that is the problem of false positives. So false positives are the result of false hybridization occurring in your reaction. And for multiplex PCR, designing your primers to be specific is absolutely critical. Because in a multiplex PCR, there are so many primers and so many amplicons that the possibility of getting cross hybridizations becomes huge and grows very quickly. In fact, it grows uh, exponentially. So, I will show you in a moment that the tool that most people use for such specificity tests is a blast search, and that is really not the best tool for the job. The second thing about um, false positives is the idea at part C here, that multiplex is a complex interacting system. False amplicons can, can involve uh, rare hybridization reactions and weak hybridization reactions, not perfect matches, but but hybridizations that involve mismatches or even bulges in them. And, you know, a tool like BLAST just is not up to that task. So what we need is a tool that can scan huge numbers of primers against large numbers of genome databases. And that is uh, challenging. Let's take a minute and talk a little bit about the approach that many scientists take, which is to use a BLAST program, BLAST, to predict their primer specificity. Of course, I don't need to say that to, to explain much about this to this audience. BLAST is one of the most widely used bioinformatics tools in the world, and deservedly, it deserves a lot of credit. But it really was not intended for the purpose of detecting primer specificity. Instead, it was really meant to determine sequence similarity and to infer common evolutionary ancestry, and it's wonderful for that function. But the algorithm um, is really has some problems with it for the purpose of primer specificity. So what's wrong with using BLAST to predict cross-hybridization? Well, the fundamental problem is that BLAST 
searches based on sequence similarity, not sequence complementarity. Now that deficiency immediately leads to a workaround that all users of BLAST have to do. And what they do is say, well, since BLAST can't find duplex complementarity, what I'll do is I'll take the complement of my, my oligo and then take that complement and use BLAST to find similarities to the complement. Now this workaround produces five big problems. The first is BLAST gives the wrong ranking of hits because it's based on an evolutionary scoring model, not based on thermodynamics of hybridization. Furthermore, BLAST misses about 80% of the thermodynamically stable hits. So many of the things that could cause a false amplification reaction in your reaction are not caught by the BLAST search. Further, BLAST is often used against uh, a large database, like the nucleotide database collection. And as a result of that, it gives too many irrelevant hits. So it misses the hits you're interested in and need, and it gives you hits that you don't care about. All right, so you get a deluge of information. You know, further, BLAST does not distinguish between hits that are extensible by some rates versus those that are not. And it also does not have the detection of amplicons or the detection of multiplex. My take home message here is that sequence similarity is not the same thing as thermodynamic stability. And that's very easy to illustrate. For example, that workaround of assuming that you're going to take the complement of your oligo and scan it against using BLAST to find similarities. That is a tantamount to assuming that GC base pairs are equal in stability to AT base pairs, which we know is not correct. Of course, GC base pairs are generally more stable than AT base pairs. And in fact, to accurately predict melting temperature, and delta G, thermodynamics, things of that nature, you need a nearest neighbor model. In addition, BLAST scores all mismatches the same. All right, it just says, hey, there was a mutation here. It doesn't know that different uh, mismatches are different. So a GT mismatch, which is known to be stabilizing, is scored by BLAST the same as a CC mismatch would be. And of course, that is not true. Those differ in thermodynamic uh, equilibrium constant by more than a factor of 4,000 in equilibrium constant. So that's a huge effect. BLAST also scores gaps incorrectly you know, from a thermodynamic perspective. It's thinking about them as insertions and deletion events. And we're thinking about them as as unpaired nucleotides in the thermodynamics thereof. Dangling ends, which are the extra nucleotides at the end of the base pair duplex, also contribute significantly, almost as much as a full base pair. And those dangling end effects are completely neglected by BLAST. BLAST doesn't include different rules for DNA-RNA hybridization versus DNA-DNA. All right, it doesn't include effects for salt and temperature, and it has the wrong rules for multiple mismatches. And the location of mismatches are not accounted for differently. But the most important negative is that a BLAST search has a minimum word length, seven consecutive perfect matches. If your hybridization does not contain seven consecutive perfect matches, then it will not be detected. And here are some examples of three extremely stable thermodynamic hits that BLAST would completely miss. It'd be completely blind to these due to that minimum word length limitation. Well, we've developed a solution to this problem called Thermoblast. Thermoblast, really, it has the sort of a, the speed of BLAST and database capabilities of BLAST and more, but it is really based on a completely different set of algorithms. It's using thermodynamics-based scoring. It has a completely different method for finding the seeds and extension algorithms. Um, it has the ability to incorporate genome playlists, and we've now uh, included massive cloud computing to allow this to be run with parallel computing. You have a nice genome viewer and it automatically detects ampl uh, amplicons. So take home message here is Thermoblast ranks the hits based on thermodynamic affinity rather than similarity. That's a key part. And what we'll be sharing with you later on, the reason I went through this discourse was to to show you that thermoblast is now integrated into other solutions that we'll be sharing with you later. While we're on the topic of thermoblast, we have this thing called the playlist that I wanted to share with you. So there's three different types of playlists that I'll be showing you. One are called the inclusivity playlist. This is the list of variants of the genomes that you want to detect and that you want your primers to cover. That's called the inclusivity list. And we're going to be using the Zika virus as a, as a uh, example in our demo. So this is a good place where we had 168 different Zika genomes. 
Now, in addition, so this is a place where um, uh, by putting in the things that you want to detect, we're going to use thermoblast to det determine the coverage of a set of primers. Now, alternatively, thermoblast can be used to determine false positives. If you take a set of primers and scan them against viruses and bacteria that are, might cause a false positive in your assay, then you would uh, find these false positives. And thermoblast is wonderful for this. It's very easy to make collections of near neighbor viruses, like a dengue fever virus is also a flavivirus, like the Zika virus is. And so their sequences can be quite related to each other. We can make a collection of dengue fever viruses. We run thermoblast to make sure that none of our primers for Zika bind to, to uh, dengue fever, and then none of our dengue fever viruses bind to Zika primers. So this is a way to determine false positives. Another type of false positive becomes <clears throat> is there because of the possibility of a background genome. You know, you're doing your genetic test for the presence of a Zika virus infection, but the human genome is present in the sample that you took from the person. And so you might want to, you should check your primers to be sure that they don't bind in the human genome or human RefSeq or other unrelated fever-causing viruses. For example, the chikungunya virus is a toga virus not that closely related to a flabby virus, but closely enough that you may get it hit. And you might want to put such viruses into a, a background playlist. All right, we'll come back to this slide when we go to do the demo. The third cause of multiplex problems is the issue of coverage. All right, and there's, I want to make a definition here of two different types of coverage. The first type of coverage is coverage of different variants of the target. And that we've called consensus design. We want a single set of primers or uh, two sets of primers or three sets of primers that <coughs> will bind to all variants of the given target. In our example, we'll be using census. We're going to design primers, a minimal number of primers, to amplify all 168 Zika virus. Another type of coverage is the problem of when you have multiple very different targets. For example, suppose you wanted to amplify a hundred different genes from the human genome uh, simultaneously. Well, they're all very different from each other, and that would be a high-level multiplex. So we'll cover that one as well. So first of all, let's talk about the idea of consensus design. Traditionally, people would use the multiple sequence alignment algorithm to take the sequence variant, and they would try to, to use the MSA algorithm to identify the conserved regions. And we'll see why that is not a very good approach. And fundamentally, what they're trying to do there when they do that is answer the question, well, okay, I want to design a new test for human papillomavirus. Where should I target the design of my oligos in that huge virus? Well, you would try to use conservation to do that, and we'll show why that doesn't work very well. All right, and another question comes up about what does it mean to be covered? All right, we'll go through a little bit about what those criteria would be for being covered. And then lastly, on the topic of multiplexing, how do you get all of the primers to work well together? See, there's a lot of things here that we need to think about. All right, so what's wrong with using a multiple sequence alignment, which I would say most people would be their first go-to method for, for trying to do consensus design? Well, one problem is the computational problem. You know, the sequences that are present in GenBank are just growing exponentially every year, and the multiple sequence alignment Alignment algorithms do not scale well for large databases, both in terms of length of the sequences and the number of sequences. So most MSA algorithms uh, are just plain can't do a thousand different sequences that are the full length genome. It just can't do it. They can do regions and things like that. So that gets immediately, that's limiting. Now another problem is that the pairwise alignment themselves that are used to make the multiple sequence alignment, those are poor. And you can tell they're poor immediately. Look at any uh, multiple sequence alignment, and look in the pair, in the uh, coding regions, the protein coding regions. Every single place where you sing, uh, see a single nucleotide insertion or deletion, or two nucleotide insertion and deletion, you immediately know that that alignment cannot be correct because they should be using triplet codons in order to. So you either have triplet insertions or tripleted deletions in coding regions. So, so you see that very commonly, and that is just telling you that the alignments are junk. All right, so sequence similarity is the wrong metric. And one of the reasons why the MSA alignments are not very good is that nucleotide sequence is information poor. 
you only have four different letters, A, C, G, and T. And it, it's just very hard. It does a lot of sequence variation, particularly in viruses and bacteria. A lot of sequence variation, and the MSAs just don't work that well, particularly for primer design. What does it mean to be covered? Inclusivity playlist contains sequence variants. So what are our criteria for whether a primer will bind to all of the members or any particular member in the inclusivity? Well, to answer that question, we need to know a lot more about polymerase extensibility rules. What hybridization lead to extensibility? What mismatches are tolerable and yet retain extensibility and also high efficiency of amplification? Well, those are things that most users don't know. And those are things that we've been investigating experimentally at DNA Software for years now. And we've incorporated those things into our software. So I'll be showing you already that BLAST is the wrong approach for such problems. Multiple sequence alignment algorithms are the wrong approach. What is the right approach? Again, Thermal Blast is very good at properly computing inclusivity coverage. It uses a proper thermodynamic scoring for duplex complementarity. It analyzes hits for polymerase extensibility. It automatically detects the amplicons that are created by pairs of primers. And we get output let is shown here, for example, where we can see for all the members of an inclusivity set, we can see how the primers that we design cover them. And we can see the locations where there are mismatches. And the primer designs have been optimized to put these mismatches in places that are tolerable by a polymerase. Lastly is the idea of getting everything to play well together. So in multiplex PCR, you have all these primers they can interact in unpredictable ways, unpredictable for a human, at least. Uh, and the optimization is a multidimensional landscape here of varying different primers and different concentrations and all kinds of things that are very hard for a human to sort of keep in their mind at once. You know, no one can sort of keep in mind a million different primers, uh, hybridizing to different locations and trying to find the combinations thereof that work well together. And the iterative empirical approach is suboptimal. I'll be recovering that in a moment. So what we need is a 21st century approach to solve this kind of problem. All right, let's take a look for a moment at the empirical approach that most researchers uh, resort to, mainly because they don't have any other alternative. The first approach is the empirical approach. So they say, all right, let's start with optimization of individual single plexes let's make primers for each one of our individual targets then we'll try to combine the single plexes into smaller multiplexes successively making the multiplex larger and larger and as we make the multiplex larger when we see a problem we'll fix the single plex that doesn't play well together all right and this problem is a one-dimensional search at a time all right and the problem is you're making changes to the system without knowing why the failures occurred for each of those primers. Okay, well, this approach typically takes a PhD level, excuse me, scientist with several um, technicians and associate primers start failing. And it's just mystifying. And it becomes a whack-a-mole type of problem where, you know, you solve one problem and boom, another one pops up. You solve that one and a different one pops up. And this is the consequence of this sort of one-dimensional linear approach to try to solve one uh, primer set at a time. All right, and the problem with this is multiplex PCR is not a linear system, it's a complex system with many interacting variables. Cross hybridization causes artifacts. Individual PCRs are optimized to work at different conditions, not under the one universal condition needed for the multiplex. And furthermore, amplicons are amplified at different rates because of the folding that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Think about the computational scale of multiplexing. How difficult is it, not only for humans to do in the laboratory, how difficult is it for a computer to do it? Well, this multiplexing involves finding sets of primers that are mutually compatible. Where compatible, compatible here means finding primer sets that amplify with similar efficiency and do not form false amplicons. So that is a really tough thing to achieve. For example, Suppose you had a 20-plex, 20 different panels, and you want to design 10 primer pairs for each of those 20 panels in the hope that one of those primer pairs might play well together with each other, uh, with the other members of the 20-plex. So to do that, you'd have 200 forward primer candidates 
and 200 reverse primer candidates. And you might say, okay, well, 200 primers, that's not too bad. How many combinations of multiplex are there? With that level of multiplexing, the number of possible combinations of multiplex is 10 to the 20th power. 10 to the 20th. Think Avogadro's number, all right? Huge number of possibilities. Many more than any group of humans could ever try. Many more than most computers could try nowadays. So what we need here is not brute force. We need an elegant algorithm that can solve this exponential explosion that occurs when you go to larger multiplex. I might add that each of those members, each of those 10 to the 20th possibilities would require running a separate thermal blast in order to check for the false amplification. So that's even worse than you might think uh, to, to bring this uh, all together. Well, we get to our fourth and last um, problem of multiplex PCR, and that is company resource constraint. And I believe that this is really the number one cause of failure of multiplex PCR. Many users get locked into a paradigm. They use the wrong tools. They're using freeware or you know, tools that are inappropriate for the, for the need. Or they have, uh, and they don't uh, uh, they, uh, take a wrong approach, all right? They use empirical optimization. Why? Because that's what they've done in the past and they're comfortable with it, but it leads to suboptimal results or complete failure. Another problem with uh, company resource constraint here is the idea that they have a lack of knowledge. The team may have strengths in some scientific areas, but not strengths in all of the areas that are needed in order to solve the multiplex problem. Think about just the things I've covered in the lecture today. Uh, we talked about thermodynamics of hybridization and folding. We talked about setting cutoffs for delta Gs and what is an extensible hit versus not extensible hit. Well, that's a great deal of knowledge that many groups just don't have expertise or knowledge. All right. So, at DNA Software, we've uh, compiled a great body of expertise in biophysics and kinetics, thermodynamics, computer science, simulation optimization, and engineering. These are skills that either are lacking in many organizations or even if they're present, it would take years for the, to develop the solution that would utilize the experience. And lastly, um, the computer infrastructure. We wanted to take a 21st century approach that didn't use just the desktop computing or laptop computing, but took advantage of a cluster computer to solve things in ways that were not possible five, even five years ago. So my message here is don't go it alone. Get help. DNA software can help you with your problem. Here is a kind of typical treadmill uh, that many, many research groups get stuck in. And they think that they're saving money by using freeware, all right? And I think everyone knows that nothing is free in life. And in fact, the design freeware is very, very expensive to your group. Think about this cycle of design here. You start off with your design freeware, and immediately you waste time and money trying to get the output from one software to go into the next software package that you're trying to use, trying to shoehorn your problem into the capabilities of those software. Once you even get through that step, you get some design results, but they're crappy results. How do you really know that those are going to work? Well, you know they're not. You're going to take them and maybe do an additional step of running blasts on them to see if they're specific. We show that that doesn't, is really not the right approach. But you go ahead and you order the oligo, you spend more money doing that, particularly on the labeled probes and primers. Last, do the experimental testing, which is a big amount of money on just all of your design, all of your team doing all of that work to show that those PCRs don't work. So you go through the classic wash, rinse, repeat cycle over and over and over again not making a lot of progress. So if you're wondering how much money you're wasting on your process, you can go to our, uh, actually you should call us on our webpage. We have this return on investment calculator, ROI calculator. And we'll work with you to sort of assess what you're spending currently. Maybe you don't even realize how much you're spending on your PCR design. And we can show you how using Panelplex, which I'll show in a moment, it can help solve your problem. Now, we're done with the four problems of multiplex PCR. I told you, I think you can appreciate the level of difficulty. Now let's try to show you a solution to this problem. So before I show you Panelplex, I want to say just a few words about it. So Panelplex solves all four of the problems that I've talked to you today about multiplex design. It's an integrated solution 
It works. You do not need to be an expert in thermodynamics or an expert in kinetics or know all those rules about polymerase extensibility that I talked about today. Instead, um, you can use Panelplex to solve your problems. And Panelplex itself consists of four design modules. They're all integrated into one simple to use user interface. The first engine is called the designer engine. The designer engine is what accounts for all the folding and hybridization reactions, and it simulates all of those, and it solves to find all the false negative problems that we talked about and finds the sweet spots for design. Thermoblast is integrated as a part of Panelplex. It's integrated to determine coverage and also false positives. So that helps with both the false negatives and false positive problems that we talked about today. Targan is a target analysis program that analyzes up front the inclusivity and exclusivity playlist to find the regions of the targets that are most likely to be amenable to design. This part of the program I didn't get to discuss today, but it's the replacement for that multiple sequence alignment, which really is not appropriate for designing multiplex. And then lastly is the multi-pick algorithm. Multi-pick combines all of the different singleplex candidates into many different permutations, and it is guaranteed to find the top end multiplex solutions um, even out of that 10 to the 20th, it's guaranteed to find the best. Not, uh, not approximate, it's guaranteed. Now, also, I want to say this. I can brag about this algorithm because I'm not the one who invented this algorithm. This was invented by my team, who I'm very proud of. So they used a breadth-first pruning algorithm to solve this combinatorial explosion. So it's computationally tractable. So my bottom line message here is think about this. We spent more than 15 years and more than 15 million dollars thinking about and experimenting on multiplex VCR so you don't have to. This brings me to the topic of the demo. And I'm going to show you Panelplex in a moment. Let's go ahead and go back to the PowerPoint presentation. What are the benefits, John? Okay. Well, the benefits are that this is going to re drastically reduce your assay time from, from weeks to less than, from, from, less than a, from a year to less than a week. Most of that week time is not the design. The design's finished in a few hours. Most of that time is spent with you doing the validation and much reduced iterations required to get a final diagnostic quality design that has minimal false positives and false negatives. We'll go ahead and summarize uh, what we told you today. We talked about the four problems that cripple multiplex PCR. We talked about false negatives, false positives, poor coverage of target mutants, all right, and we talked about the lack of organizational resources and how the solution to these problems requires sophisticated algorithms and appropriate computational resources. All right, now I wanted to mention to you that we, Panelplex is an ongoing uh, development. We have finished the part of Panelplex that is used for doing infectious disease. That's why I showed the Zika virus as a, as a uh, example today, but it works also for human targets and bacteria. Uh, we are working right now on the applications for next-gen sequencing, which will involve integrating our multi-pick algorithm, which I talked a little bit about, uh, and we expect that that will be released for general release in September of this year, but currently we can, multi-pick is fully functioning, it's completed, just hasn't been integrated yet into Panelplex, and so Currently, we're offering um, multiplex design for applications like NGS uh, by a, a concierge service where we do it as a consulting uh, contract. All right, and then lastly, we have a third variant of Panelplex which we're scheduling for release in early 2018 that will allow SNP and strain genotyping. All right, so important point here is no more whack-a-mole. You won't have to go through this successive banging your head against the wall with trying to empirically find your multiplex and optimize. Okay, so I've been monitoring the questions. John, there's over Jessica wants to know, how do we know these designs actually work? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. You know, there is really no other way to test the design, uh, to know if a design works, but to go into the lab and try it. However, what I can tell you is we have a vast body of experimentation that we have done to validate that the results work. So one of our customers, for example, we were able to design uh, 32 different panels
for infectious diseases in the upper respiratory tract, both viruses and bacterial targets, and make those work together in a multiplex. And it worked on the first try. All of the oligos worked 100%. There were a few that, you know, actually the customers started getting greedy and wanted us to make a, improve about 10% of the primers they wanted to make even better, which was crazy. But we were able to even meet that demand. We have another customer that asked us to do, um, it just happened to also be 32 different messenger RNA targets. And we've been able to design for them uh, a multiplex for 32 different targets and isoforms thereof, messenger RNA isoforms, and make it so that they target it. RNA, uh, the different uh, targeted specific junctions, exon exon junctions in their RNAs. So it's been extensively validated. Our models have been extensively validated in the lab as well. So we're very confident that this is going to dramatically reduce your effort. And how do you support the design of assays, including internal amplification controls? Ah, um, in both of the projects I just mentioned, internal amplification controls was one of the the members of the multiplex, and um, there, uh, I didn't mention this, but you can implement um, the control as a fixed part of the design. In other words, it will, uh, let's say you already have the design for your control, then you can input that into the software, and it will design all the other members of the multiplex in the presence of that control. Obviously, John, this is not freeware. This is, uh, this is designed for more complex problems. And the reason why I say that is Tom wants to know how is licensing handled um, and how, what are the, what's the cost structure for, for this? Well, we can work with customers in a variety of way, we're, ways. We're open to many different business models. But the two main ways that folks work with us is either they have, uh, some users just have a limited number of designs that they want to do, maybe only one. And in such a case, um, it might be best to work with us in a concierge model where we um, write a quote to you on, depending on the scale of the project, how, how big the multiplex is and how complex it is and what other demands you might have for the design of the project. And we would give a quote. A typical quote would be something on the order of $20,000 for a project like that. They can be quite complex and involved, but it can save uh, development teams months and months and months of effort and we are going to get a beautiful design right out of the bat almost every time. The other way that we work with customers is with an annual license model, which is $5,000 per month for the software. For the software, $60,000 per year. The users can use the engine, the Panelplex, pretty much as, as much as they want. Uh, and they own the designs, and that's our business model. Can you train them? Yes, of course. We have uh, extensive documentation, and we're happy to certainly walk people through the first few times they use Panelflex uh, with our best practices. And also, <clears throat> we can consult if it's necessary to do higher level things if it goes beyond the scope of. But we will, we will do simple uh, requests as people need and you know, support things as, as we go. There will be a white paper available mid next week that all of you will get uh, a copy of about the problems with Multiplex. A recorded version of this webinar will be available, um, and we will also send that to you. And of course, you can sign up for a free call and consultation on Multiplex. Just uh, um, contact us through the website, and we would be more than happy to, uh, to follow up with you on that. With that, we'd like to thank you for your time and attention in this webinar today. The four most common problems in Multiplex panel design. John, I want to thank you for a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ted, and thank you to everyone for attending. I really appreciate it. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, and have a pleasant afternoon.